Muchísimas gracias y muy buenos días. Es un gran honor para mí, la verdad, estar aquí en esta ciudad tan bella, aquí en el Museo Thyssen, una institución tan importante y lo más importante con ese grupo de colegas tan brillante. Estoy muy agradecida a Alba y a Paloma para la invitación y y uh, también a Esther para la ayuda con la organización y a todos ustedes también por juntarse con nosotros hoy. Muchas gracias. In Martin Johnson Heed's Orchid and Hummingbird near a mountain waterfall, here in the collection at the Tyson, the bird turns its sharp pointed beak toward fleshy petals as though engaging the flower in a conversation. He'd created new dramas for these characters, the orchid and the hummingbird, again and again, setting them against backdrops of tangled foliage, illuminating them with light filtered through misty skies, framing them with gnarled trees. Here, a curving branch on the left somehow supports both the orchid and the hummingbird in the foreground and kind of drifts onto these tiny little twigs in the background. Like a bridge between the foreground and the background, this branch attempts to create a logical transition between the hummingbird that we see close up in sharp detail and the softly rendered miniature landscape that appears far away from us. He'd created such dynamic paintings filled with this push and pull of disjointed scale following his travels to Latin America and the Caribbean in the 1860s and in 1870, including to Brazil, Nicaragua, and Colombia. These recently independent countries were rich with environmental resources that were drawing people, so industrialists as well as artists, from the United States. Heed's observations of birds and flowers in these places, where many of them were part of the native lands, have given his work the weight of scientific authority. But by the time that he completed this particular painting in 1902, only two years before his death, he had not actually been to Latin America in over 30 years. And so he would have relied on his memories, not only of his travels, but also of his own earlier paintings, built up from fragments, sketches that he had made decades before. And even related works from earlier in his career, such as these two paintings of orchids and hummingbirds in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, or the MFA where I work, these are compositions made in the studio that combine imagery both real and imagined. He did not simply produce direct, unmediated recordings of nature. He also drew heavily on processes that required the very separation of birds and flowers from nature. So including examining birds that had been tamed, stuffed, and skinned. Flowers grown in greenhouses and illustrations from botanical publications. Orchids and spray orchids with hummingbirds in the center here shows how he'd skillfully combined precise details to construct a fictional scene. The birds are Peruvian sheertails from the Andean regions of Peru and Ecuador. The orchid in the lower right is a Catalea labiata, native to Brazil. And the clusters of small orchid blossoms hanging from the top are found in Nepal, India, and the Philippines. The palm tree in the background on the right confirms that this is an exotic location, even if it only exists in the fantasy of this picture. The tensions between details and generalizations in Heed's paintings are also apparent in discussions of his travels to Latin America. While his representations of Latin American birds and plants are consistently described in terms of their accuracy and high level of detail, scholars who almost always write from US perspectives offer few details about what was going on in these countries when he'd went there, what forms of art were already being made when he arrived, local significances of flora and fauna, or even exactly where he went. So while we know, for example, that he'd worked in the 10th Street Studio Building during his time in New York, it is often unclear even which cities he visited in all of Brazil or Colombia, places that are often just glossed as South America or part of the even more homogenizing term, the tropics. So the title of my talk today, Martin Johnson Heed in the United States of Colombia, intends to allude to some of the specificities of time and place that we've been missing, although I will spend a significant part of my presentation on Heed's time in Brazil, which is the most well-documented of his travels. When he went to Colombia in 1870, the country was called the United States of Colombia, and it had nine major states, including Panama, which would not become an independent nation until 1903. 
As we follow heed into the empire of Brazil and the United States of Colombia today, I hope to highlight not only the geographic and political conditions that he was entering, but also to simply ask what the art worlds looked like at the time. This is very early research in what I hope to develop into a more extensive project, one that will consider Latin American artists who are Heed's contemporaries, as well as indigenous artists who are routinely excluded from scholarship on the rapid growth of art, science, and modernity in the 19th century Americas. This is not a story of influence. I am not arguing that Heed saw the works of these artists and was changed by them, but rather a broader exploration of different art forms emerging from the same time and place, of multiple art histories with significance to their related communities, art histories that do not need to be validated through direct connections to a single foreign artist's experiences. Heat is the entry point for this work, but not necessarily the end point. So we'll start with part one, Heat in the Empire of Brazil. On August 12th, 1863, the Boston Evening Transcript reported that Martin Johnson Heed, quote, the artist so well known for his landscapes, with rich sunsets and sparkling stretches of ocean, is about to visit Brazil to paint those winged jewels, the hummingbirds. The newspaper also mentioned that he was working toward, quote, fulfilling the dream of his boyhood, suggesting that Heed was interested in hummingbirds long before he traveled to Latin America. The trajectory of his life and the development of his paintings, from early portraits to landscapes to still lifes, is detailed in the writings of Theodore Stebbins, author of the Heed Catalog Resonate, and my material today builds on Dr. Stebbins' work. Heed's fascination with hummingbirds likely developed during his youth, where he grew up in rural Pennsylvania, um, part of a well-off uh, farming family. And he grew up hunting, fishing, and hiking. These are engagements with the, national, the natural world that many American artists have incorporated into their painting practices. And we can actually see this sort of well into 20th century modernism. I think yesterday we talked a little bit about Arthur Dove, and he's another one who I think of as a kind of um, outdoors person whose um, practices kind of shaped his work. Heed's earliest surviving painting of a hummingbird is from 1862. It's a tiny panel, only about five inches high, depicting a ruby-throated hummingbird feeding from a nasturtium blossom that turns to meet the bird's beak. I'm struck here not only by the ways in which Heed is already creating dialogues between the birds and flowers, as we've seen in the Thiessen's much later painting, but also how in this early moment, he's already experimenting with these tangled stems that kind of encircle the hummingbirds, swooping both above and below. These web-like stems become the center of the composition in Passion Flowers and Hummingbirds, a work completed at least 10 years later, as they seem to grow from the mossy landscape near the bottom of the painting and hang from the branches near the top, forming a loose green knot in the middle. The representations of the birds and the foliage on which they perch were informed by publications by leading naturalists such as John James Audubon and especially the British ornithologist John Gould. But just as Heed's visionary paintings of hummingbirds do not look like any other American landscapes of the period, his work also departs from the conventions of scientific illustration. The hard edges of the stems, contorted into forms that would not be found in nature, perhaps recall other printed images, such as chapter letters in illuminated manuscripts, or the more democratic designs of headings in magazines from the period. So the letter C, for example, in this special issue of the Companion Poets for the People Illustrated from, 19, from 1865, similarly twists into a knot and then loops outward to connect to other letters, which are framed by these trailing vines that border the domestic scene in the middle. And there's even like a little bird up here. Heed would have been familiar with such publications as he was a prolific writer as well as a visual artist. He published poetry, essays, and over 100 articles in the magazine Forest and Stream, including some reflecting on his travels in Latin America, many of which are now the basis for research um, from his time there. One of the poets he admired most was John Greenleaf Whittier, whose song lyrics are the subject of this publication. Scholars have described Heed's background as a self-taught artist who studied with so-called folk artists as the root of his enduring interests in bold geometric forms and also painting in series. Exploration of the visual aspects rather than just the textual content of literary publications from the period could offer an additional route through which to trace the significance of vernacular art and design on his work. <laughs> 
After developing his painting practice in different regions of the United States in the 1850s, including St. Louis, Chicago, New York, and Boston, he'd boarded a steamship called the Golden City on September 2nd, 1863, and landed in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil about two and a half weeks later. He would began to record his observations, which immediately reveal the prejudices that he brought with him as a white man visiting from the United States. Describing the Rio Harbor, he writes, quote, the dream one feels an inclination to indulge in on beholding such a world of beauty at a distance must give place to such a crushing disappointment on mingling in the unsavory streets with the miserable race that peoples them. The whole city literally swarms with the raggedest and vilest looking set of slaves, and people accustomed to civilization and decency would hardly wish to have the common natives even passed betwixt the wind and their nobility. The quote at the end is paraphrased from Shakespeare's Henry IV, a line about maintaining physical distance between bodies deemed to be worthy and others slovenly. While Heat expresses a desire to engage with the natural landscape surrounding Rio, and even, quote, some of the better class, it is the marginalized people, enslaved Africans, members of the working class, whom he views as disruptions within the panorama of the city. Although, though he may have identified as an anti-slavery and even socially progressive American, his position of privilege prohibits him from seeing these people as equals or as part of the longer history of this land. Men, women, and children who were stolen from Africa and until only about 40 years prior colonized by Portugal. Heed's journal also shows his awareness of the fact that Brazil is a new country. As he writes, quote, the argument sometimes brought forward in defense of Brazilian stupidity is that she is a young nation and that consequently but little can be expected of her. It has never been necessary to advance an excuse of that kind for the United States, and no sane person should do it for Brazil, for the cases are alike. But the cases, of course, were nothing alike. In the early 19th century, Brazil was the only colony in the Americas in which the king from the mother country ruled from the local capital rather than somewhere across the ocean. Elite Brazilians, unlike their counterparts in the colonial United States, did not have powerful international allies, such as the French and Dutch, to help finance the independence movement. And in 1822, Brazil maintained, rather than broke with the European style of imperial government, becoming the only monarchy in South America, surrounded on all sides by new republics, many of which boycotted the empire. While he'd suggest that lower class people were to blame for the poverty in Rio, it was rather the outcome of centuries of colonization, exploitation of natural resources, and an economy almost entirely dependent on slavery. These historical, historical conditions shaped his travels to Brazil in the 1860s, even if they aren't explicitly visualized in his paintings. He'd spent much of his time with other visitors and expats from the United States and England and described staying with a Henry Milford across the bay from the center of Rio. It is presumably here that he painted a series of small canvases depicting male and female pairs of hummingbirds perched on thin branches with mountains, palms, and moody clouds in the background. These are now in the collection of Crystal Bridges. I think Mindy showed a slide of them yesterday and she also has done some important work on these that hopefully she can share. Nearly all of these birds are shown with nests, relating to both scientific questions about the origins of species and domestic ideals about families, and also recalling Heed's reflection in a later article, quote, when I was about starting on one of my visits to South America, Professor Agassi requested me to procure for him from about 50 to 100 eggs of hummingbirds to be used for scientific purposes. He added that Louis Agassiz, the prominent biologist and natural history scholar, quote, was apparently ignorant of the fact that one of their nests is seldom found even in South America. So he knows like more than Agassiz in this moment. He therefore shows in images what would have been nearly impossible to encounter in nature. And these pictures were intended to be broadly distributed in a lavish folio called the Gems of Brazil in the style of Gould or Audubon to share this rare experience with broad audiences. Although he did work with printers in London to produce a set of chromolithographs, his dream of completing the folio was plagued by struggles to secure subscribers and finance the publication. Ellery Fouch, who has done some of the most extensive research on the gems of Brazil, observes that after the failure of this printing project, he'd produced his own multiples and reproductions by hand, revisiting the theme of hummingbirds in his paintings for the rest of his career. 
He displayed his hummingbird paintings in Rio in February of 1864 at the annual exhibition of the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts. The building, which is shown here doing a later renovation, originally opened in 1826. In the decades after Emperor Dom Pedro II assumed power of independent Brazil in 1840, the Academy received generous funding for the annual exhibition and prizes for artists. Although Dom Pedro II has been mythologized as a great leader, Lilia Moritz Schwartz has shown that he had little involvement in politics or economics, and that his greatest strengths were in using rituals and symbols to quell mistrust of the monarchy while simultaneously strengthening Brazilian nationalism. With the economy stabilized by coffee sales in the mid-19th century, the emperor could act as nearly a full-time patron of the arts, personally bankrolling educational and cultural organizations, such as the Brazilian Historical and Geographical Institute, and these actions were maintained his popularity for nearly 50 years. After seeing Heed's paintings both during a private meeting and at the academy, Dom Pedro II awarded the artist a medal, the Imperial Order of the Rose, an honor that is almost always highlighted in scholarship on Heed's time in Brazil. But it seems notable that Dom Pedro II gave out thousands of these medals, by one estimate over 14,000, all of which declared love and faithfulness, amor e fedelidade, to his own empire. So this perhaps speaks to his ability to wield royal symbols as a strategy of international diplomacy, garnering support at the same time that he appeared to give it. One of the most important symbols of order, critical to combating old stereotypes about social chaos in Latin America, was the image of the emperor himself. So this image had to assert the European origins of the monarchy and also be legible as distinctly Brazilian. His likeness was mass produced on inexpensive collectibles like handkerchiefs, fans, and decks of cards, but also through formal portraits like these, which were commissioned for all the provinces of the empire, for every government office in Rio, and regularly copied by artists. On the left, we see him as a young king, looking out from the frame of the picture as though contemplating the future of Brazil, his knuckles resting lightly on the velvet-covered table. On the right, he is the white-bearded patriarch, now gripping the scepter and standing ready to lead the General Assembly. In both portraits, he wears full majestic regalia, much of the style borrowed from 17th century English robes, but combined with elements evocative of Brazilian land and history. Some of his garments were embroidered with designs of coffee and tobacco leaves, and over his green velvet mantle, he wore a short cape made of breast feathers from channel-billed toucans. His father, Dom Pedro I, who had declared independence from Portugal in 1822, introduced this garment supposedly as an homage to, Brazil, to Brazil's birds, as well as to their indigenous leaders, who had long worn regalia made of feathers. The first version of the cape was purportedly commissioned from the Tirillo community, who today live in northern Brazil and Suriname. Dr. Moritz Schwartz describes the feather cape as a way to tropicalize the monarchy, a smooth incorporation of native representation into the official image of independent Brazil in a way that highlighted beauty and riches while masking violence and oppression. While indigenous feather work may have been part of Dom Pedro II's court, actual indigenous people were not. In his travel journal, he describes Dom Pedro II looking at a portrait of himself at the 1864 Academy Exhibition, which could have been this one by Vitor Mereles de Lima. He writes, quote, his imperial majesty stopped some time before a full-length portrait of himself, and then went up to my meadow scene, which he looked at a long time. The exhibition was not quite up to the Gotham standard, but the portrait of the emperor was quite a good thing though the accessories were rather weak. While they may not have been up to Heed's exacting standards, the objects in the background reveal much about the image that Dom Pedro II hoped to project. At a time when tensions between Brazil and Paraguay would lead to one of the most violent wars in the history of the Americas, the emperor wears a uniform confirming his status as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but he also stands in a furnished interior, in front of books and a globe, the classic representations of intellectual rather than military life. On the right, a bust suggests the lineage of graying rulers of the past, 
And as a contrast, the landscape paintings that we can see kind of in this upper right corner are perhaps most indicative of the modern future. Although they are only loosely rendered, palm trees are visible within the oval frame in the upper right, suggesting images of the Brazilian land at a time before a tradition of landscape painting was really established there. As part of an institution dedicated to shaping a national narrative, instructors at the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts prioritized history painting. However, the landscape functions like a protagonist in some of these academic works. In the first mass in Brazil from 1860, a missionizing scene that is one of the most important Brazilian history paintings of the period, and also by Mireles, the mountains and the palms do more than just locate us in a tropical region. The tree on the right, heavy with vines and supporting an indigenous man on its branches, seems to lean in like the human figures, as though equally captivated by the service. Near the bottom left, the bodies of native people overlap with the massive leaves of a taioba plant, as though both are growing from the earth itself. The natural world is also being subjugated here, as in the upper left, a wooden cross, so once a tree itself, right, that's now been civilized, rises above the rest of the forest, and a palm behind it even seems to curve into a slight bow. The careful sketch, which shows vines wrapping around larger tree trunks beneath layers of varied foliage, seems to confirm Mireles' interest in representing the land. And Dom Pedro II doubtlessly would have recognized the benefit that landscape, like history paintings, would have had for the Brazilian national project, consolidating the diverse environments of the vast empire into easily recognizable mountains, vistas, and of course, palm trees. He routinely welcomed traveler artists from Europe, and when he met with Heed, he not only inquired about whether or not the artists had painted any local landscapes, asking two or three times, according to Heed, but also specifically he recommended that Heed paint the view from the Boavejem seafront, a leisure space of Rio's elite. Dr. Stebbins has suggested that the painting, Sunset Harbor at Rio, which is now in the collection of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which is where Brittany works, was likely the resulting painting. This panoramic view is one that is also highly recognizable from guidebooks of the period. Like other leaders in 19th century Americas, Don Pedro II supported art forms and institutions that strengthened the identities of middle and upper class people of European descent, those who were socially coded as white, and justified their dominance over people of African and indigenous descent. The rise of history paintings showing the conversion of indigenous people coincided with Indianism, a nationalist movement in literature that situated mythical native people as tragic heroes in the story of the foundation of the Brazilian nation state. The most iconic example of Indianism in the visual arts is Mireles' Moema from 1866, a painting loosely inspired by an 18th century poem by the Augustinian friar known as Santa Rita de Rao. Rejected by a Portuguese lover, Moema leaps into the ocean and attempts to follow his ship as it leaves the coast of Bahia, only to be overcome by the sea and drown. Mireles imagines a moment after Moema's death, when her lifeless body, nude except for a strip of feathers, has washed onto the shore. To me, she appears to be sinking into the land, her hair flattened like seaweed on the sand, the curves of her full breasts and hips echoed by the rocky outcropping supporting her legs. As in Mireles' first mass in Brazil, the representation of land is crucial in this work, even if we wouldn't call it a landscape. And as in landscape painting, depictions of eroticized, dying indigenous women also become sites for the consolidation of national identity, especially during times of conflict and nation building. Take, for example, Thomas Crawford's Mexican Girl Dying, created between 1846 and 1848, the exact dates of the war between the U.S. and Mexico. Or Felipe Santiago Gutierrez's Hunter of the Andes, a Colombian-inspired composition he recreated multiple times between 1874 and 1891, when his home country of Mexico was under the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. As leaders in countries across the Americas first struggled for independence and then to define national borders and culture, the collapsing of the female indigenous body with the landscape remained central to the shaping of patriotic histories and the ideological vanquishing of indigenous power. Mireles completed Moema as the war between Brazil and Paraguay raged when the ruling class needed national heroes and symbols. <laughs> 
During the earlier years of the war, Don Pedro II was an enthusiastic supporter of the Indianism movement, which not only transformed violent histories of colonization into lyrical stories about a vanishing race, but also conveniently erased the presence of enslaved Africans who made up the great majority of Brazil's population. But after the war ended in 1870 with colossal expenditures and a massive death toll, Critics of Don Pedro II took aim at his intellectual pursuits, which they felt had little to do with running the country. In a stark difference from the royal portraits, the press pictured him as constantly distracted by arts, sciences, travel, and his romanticization of indigenous culture. In the caricature on the right, Don Pedro's white face and full beard emerge under a feathered crown, and he holds a spear instead of a scepter. An imp-like figure representing the people smirks at his bare legs and feet as though recognizing the emperor's masquerade, acknowledging how little his fascination with indigenous attire and imagery had to do with actual indigenous people. And so who were the actual indigenous people who would have been living in and around Rio de Janeiro at the time of Heed's visit? He probably would have heard of the Tupi people described in the 1857 book, Brazil and the Brazilians, which was written by his friend, the Reverend James Cooley Fletcher. His connection to Fletcher is usually cited as the reason for his trip to Brazil. While Fletcher mentions the Tupi knowledge of trees from which they produce tools, weapons, and domestic objects, he quickly moves to characterize them as irrational, warlike savages who, quote, devoured their relatives and friends as a mark of honor. In doing so, Fletcher feeds stereotypes dating from centuries earlier, when European chroniclers such as André Tivet and Théodore de Brie constructed sensationalist tales about the cannibalism and nudity of people in the so-called New World. Fletcher's writings show how these stereotypes persisted even when there was direct evidence against them as early as the 1500s, when feathered mantles, masterfully created by the Tupinamba, which is a community within the Tupi people, were collected by Portuguese explorers. Tupinamba artists would select and modify feathers from the guara, or scarlet ibis birds, attaching them to a woven net-like support and recreating the bodily forms of the animals and the glittering naturalistic effects of their feathers. Colonizers immediately recognized the significance of this art form, which was connected to indigenous religions, and they brought the mantles back to Europe as both evidence of New World otherness and to show the success of the Christian mission. Only 11 of these feathered cloaks still survive, and all of them are in European museums. But importantly, the tradition of feather work has persisted within indigenous communities in Brazil, and Tupi people created versions of this art form throughout the 19th century, so he was, when he was there and beyond, um, including this neck ornament made by an artist from the related Guarani community. Later surviving feather work also shows the incorporation of hummingbird feathers into indigenous Brazilian regalia, composed into designs that are abstract and yet still evoke the form of a bird in flight. As in the practices of white artists, these ways of making were connected to scientific knowledge and religious beliefs. The Tupi word for hummingbird, guanambi, appeared in European descriptions of Brazil dating to the mid 16th century, before later being replaced by Latin terms. There are several Guarani origin stories about hummingbirds that are richly suggestive of sharp observations about the species. In one well-known story, hummingbirds are associated with the beginnings of language, and this is likely connected to the sound of their quickly beating wings, which enables them to communicate with other birds, alerting them to the presence, for example, of a potential mate. Hence, when he came to Brazil, Martin Johnson Heed was entering a place where the study of hummingbirds and the incorporation of them into art had been going on long before 1863, all the way since time immemorial. Part two, Martin Johnson Heed in the United States of Colombia. After spending a little over six months in Rio and then traveling to London to attempt to publish his Gems of Brazil folio, Heed returned to the United States in late 1865 after the end of the American Civil War. By the summer of 1866, he'd again traveled to Latin America, this time not with the goal of creating a publication, but instead to develop his work as a painter. He first landed in Greytown, which is formerly known as San Juan del Norte, 
a port on the Caribbean coast with a long history of, com of competition between the colonial powers of Spain, England, and the US. At the time, the town had recently been rebuilt after the United States Navy completely destroyed it in 1854, supposedly in retaliation to an, for an insult to a US ambassador who was in fact harboring a murderer who was also from the US. Heath's sketches from around Greytown and also Granada, an inland town on the San Juan River, show Spanish architecture, such as this fort on the left, as well as homes made by the indigenous Mesquito people. He sketched bamboo in the bottom left corner, so he was perhaps referring to the materials that were used to construct these homes, which were made of all renewable resources, such as split bamboo and woven palms, occasionally with mud walls, which was an adaptation introduced by enslaved African people. His sketch of Lake Nicaragua, which is here on the far right, includes tiny figures swimming and bathing in the water, as well as a building in the background. Such structures and figures, however, do not appear in the Tison's Sunrise in Nicaragua, one of the few paintings related to this trip and completed about three years later in his New York studio. Here, a sailboat appears on a still, sunstruck body of water. It is a calm, orderly, light-filled passage with a low horizon line, sharply contrasting with the tangled foliage that seems to climb up the left side of the campus, of the canvas, meeting the sky in clumps of leaves and vines that come into focus in some areas, but dissolve into dark shadows in others. This type of composition reappears in Heed's of bearing similarities to his earlier views of Brazil and later landscape of Jamaica. The palm trees break away from the forest chokehold, rising above the other plants to confirm a tropical location, though exactly which one might remain unclear if we didn't have the titles. In creating these paintings, he drew on long histories of European landscape conventions, so the framing trees, distant mountains, glowing sun, but more immediately on the work of Frederick Church, who we heard Maggie talk about yesterday, the kind of superstar painter of the period, whose 1859 Heart of the Andes completely upended what people thought an American landscape could be. He deeply admired and befriended Church, who influenced Heed's visits to Latin America, as well as his artistic methods. Ambitious works, such as Heart of the Andes, were drawn from Church's travels through Ecuador and Colombia in 1853, created by carefully stitching together elements from diverse landscapes, composing them into a single new idealized vision. In the excellent catalog for the current exhibition, American Art from the Thyssen Collection, Alba Campo Rosillo describes the connections between how Church was painting and the audiences that he was serving, noting that his patrons were mostly people in the US with economic interests in Latin America. The drama of his works, which, I, which oscillate between sweeping vistas and tiny, precise botanical details, could inspire both awe and ownership. Working from travel sketches, he developed this style over years, creating smaller easel paintings that informed his highly finished monumental canvases. He completed Tropical Landscape, now in the Thyssen's collection, about four years before Heart of the Andes, based on his month-long journey down the Magdalena River in Western Colombia, then the means of transportation between the Caribbean coast and the inland capital of Bogota. While Church probably traveled in a champan, a large covered canoe that had been introduced by the Spanish in the 16th century, here we see tiny figures in a simpler vessel of the style used by the Muisca and other indigenous peoples. In the background on the right, the flaring trunk of a ceiba tree is likely based on a sketch that, tr that uh, Church would have made in the field and it's combined with a palm tree, probably from a different space. Describing Church's reconstruction of such details, Veronica Uribe Hanneberg argues that he transforms specificities into a generality, visualizing a place that is as vaguely timeless as it is tropical. She writes beautifully in the Thyssen's catalog, quote, this place stands for every place on the river, this time for all times by the river, this river for each and every river of tropical South America. When Church traveled to Colombia, he recreated the journey of Prussian naturalist and explorer Alexander von Humboldt, traveling hundreds of miles by boat, mule, and foot to access the dramatic vistas described in Humboldt's widely influential treatise, Cosmos. 
He'd also went to Colombia, but international travel meant something very different to him. After landing in Barranquilla in January of 1870, he'd sketched the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta mountain range from the nearby town, rather than hiking to get a better view of it. Church later admonished him in a letter, writing, quote, I am ashamed of you for making such a fiasco trying to find Santa Marta. Why didn't you stick to it? You have missed a big thing. It's an awfully good joke, and I won't tell Albert Bierstadt, only your good friends. Similarly, while in Nicaragua, he'd complained about the mosquitoes and wrote, quote, I thought it useless to waste much time there. I went to the Virgin Bay and from there to Granada. I stayed two weeks and took a mule ride to Masaya. That's as far as I cared to go. And in Brazil, he spent much of his time in the city of Rio, later writing that he would only travel to the interior, quote, if it could be traversed in a civilized way. Maggie Chow, who is here with us today and so can share more about her important work, has described how he'd approached not only the physical landscape differently without Church's Macho Bravado, but also the painting of the landscape differently. By creating small canvases at church, as Church created enormous ones, by magnifying details like flowers and hummingbirds and deliberately rupturing the scale of the foreground and background rather than trying to harmonize them into a cohesive whole, He'd not only distinguished himself from his mentor, he disrupted the history of landscape conventions with its seductive language of illusion as a whole. Building on Chow's argument, I think what makes Heed's hummingbird paintings so radical, particularly in relation to their small size, is the acknowledgement that a landscape painting is not actually the outdoors. Whereas Church perhaps intended to make people feel as though they were being immersed in the natural world in the style of a 19th century panorama, he openly acknowledges that a landscape painting is a thing that is typically bought, sold, and hung on a wall, usually in someone's house. Although Heed was proud of his observations of hummingbirds in nature, his works engage with the domestication of the landscape, which is not unlike his preferences for comfortable travel. While Heed may have seen this gorgeted woodstar hummingbird in a Colombian forest, he also likely purchased hummingbird skins from the markets in Barranquilla and worked from those. And around the time of his visit, Colombian artists were also deeply involved with projects to bring what they understood as an American wilderness under control. So before the founding of the first art academy in Colombia in 1886, many artists, including those coming out of Spanish colonial workshops producing Catholic art, developed their work by participating in two major scientific expeditions. The Royal Botanical Expedition, which was backed by the Spanish monarchy between 1783 and 1816, and the Choreographic Commission between 1850 and 1860, a mapping project of the independent Colombian government. Led by the Spanish board cleric and botanist Jose Celestino Mutis, the Royal Botanical Expedition began with artists drawing flowers that had been collected in the field and pressed in a studio. But Mutis eventually recruited artists such as Salvador Rizzo, who drew from nature. Rizzo's tempera paintings show how the flowers, here a clematis, were still removed from their original environments, disassociated from the supposed chaos of forests and jungles, and depicted in symmetrical, decorative designs against white backgrounds, as dictated by European conventions of botanical illustration. And here we can see, actually it's this one, the plant kind of seems to twist into a letter M, um, which is a reference to Muthis's name, so the person who was leading the expedition. And we're reminded here, I think, of his interests in these kind of artfully tangled stems. This project of extraction and translation, the making of native plants legible and attractive to European audiences, was already underway when Alexander von Humboldt arrived in Colombia in 1808 to study the Andes Mountains, traveling from Cartagena on the Caribbean coast to Bogota near the center of the city to Popayán in the southwest. Humboldt declared the artists associated with the botanical expedition, particularly Francisco Javier Matis, to be the best painters of flowers in the world. I think that Matis's work is particularly suggestive of the fertile energies that are maintained even within these highly controlled images. Red petals explode from fat pink buds. Strange raspberry-shaped blossoms seem to suddenly multiply before our eyes. And of course, we see the curving, swirling, dancing stems and roots. 
These roots become particularly animated, like extraterrestrials with their own life forces, in the images of orchids from the expedition. Jose Celestino Mutis continued to lead the expedition for 25 years, exploring over 8,000 kilometers or about 5,000 miles of the landscape of Nueva Granada or New Grenada, which then included present-day Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela. He and his team of scientists and artists would have had to rely heavily on indigenous guides and laborers, even as they erased indigenous knowledge of the plants that they studied by imposing a Linnaean system of classification over native organizational structures. The project continued after Mutis's death in 1808, but ended with the Reconquista of 1816, when Spanish armed forces attempted to extinguish independence movements in the Americas, including those that started in Bogota as early as 1810. Several of the painters who contributed to the project were put in front of firing squads, and their works, over 6,000 pictures, were shipped to Spain, and they're still preserved here in Madrid at the Real Jardín Botánico. Even though the Royal Botanical Expedition was supported by the Spanish crown, it had connections to independence in the 19th century, and such associations have only grown stronger since. So there's a scholar, Alejandro Rojas Silva, who points out that Mutis was a Spanish loyalist, but he's erroneously been recast as a kind of national icon. Unlike Mutis, the majority of the botanists and artists involved with the expedition were criollos, so people of Spanish descent who were born in Colombia, and many of them directly supported the independence movement. So for them, the rendering and the classification of such exuberant flora, vibrantly colored and depicted in a dizzying diversity of forms, seem to disprove theories about the inferiority of the climate and by extension of the people of the Americas. Such ideas had been put forward by philosophers, including the Comte de Buffon and Cornelius de Pau in the 18th century, but they still held sway among colonizing powers. These representations of fecundity and the possibilities of American land not only fostered local pride, but built confidence among elite criollo classes about their abilities to exploit natural resources and oppress indigenous peoples without the oversight or help from the mother country. While this narrative is less heroic than our typical stories about patriots versus loyalists, it is one that characterizes independence movements across the Americas. And just as landscape painting would become critical to nation building in the US, the earliest landscape paintings in Colombia, such as this example from 1814, grew out of the nationalist art of botanical illustration. So it's difficult to see in this dark slide, but um, the kinds of details that are especially in the foreground suggest that the person who made this work was part of the expedition. The associations between botanical images and national identity were maintained even as the country took new shape after 1822, when its independence was internationally recognized, and later when Ecuador and Venezuela separated from Nueva Granada. In this remarkable Trumpler lithograph from 1850, a disheveled pile of papers, some creased and torn, includes colonial documents, an old map of Spain, and prints of landscapes. A botanical illustration of flowers in bloom appears at the center, the edges of the paper yellowed with age, intersecting with many of the other objects and histories. So if the Royal Botanical Expedition was part of the Colombian independence movement, the later Core Graphic Commission expedition was part of the nation building process of the maturing country. Starting in 1850, the commission represented the first official effort to gather geographic information about New Granada through study of each of its major regions, from the Caribbean coast to the peaks of the Andes to the Eastern Plains. As Nancy P. Applebaum has shown, the purpose was to assert national sovereignty, to strengthen governance, and to spur economic development. In early modern Europe and the Iberian world, the, tor the term choreography typically referred to highly pictorial maps of local cities or regions. For Agustin Codazzi, the Italian-born engineer who led the commission in Colombia, choreography meant using a blend of narratives, images, and maps to characterize each region. And so while Codazzi worked with cartographers to depict the land, he also commissioned artists to represent landmarks, both natural, as we're seeing in the mountainous landscapes here, and urban, 
And I show these examples to show the range of the project, but also to highlight the ways that cities and architecture are so often left out of representations of Colombia by artists from the outside. In addition to capturing places, the artists working with the commission created many images of people from different backgrounds. So the distinguishing of people of different races and classes by their skin tones and their surroundings, but especially by their clothing. So for example, here, the black lace mantilla or the veil on the white woman on the left, the traditional woven hat worn by the mestiza seated in the middle. These are conventions of the costumbrista tradition that was popular in Latin America throughout the 19th century. Such images could simultaneously show diversity, but also confirm stereotypes. So black figures, for example, are almost always shown in positions of servitude or poverty, as though such conditions were their natural state. When he'd arrived in Colombia around 1870, costumbrista images were still among the most visible art forms, particularly in cities with growing tourist trades. One of his own sketches from Santa Marta, which had been a major port for the entry of enslaved Africans between the 16th and 18th centuries, depicts a black maize harvester like the figure shown on the right here, although Heed's image is not related to Costumbrista traditions. And please be aware that my next slide of, of Heed's sketch shows his original inscription, which includes a racist slur that was no less dehumanizing in his day than it is now. He collapses the figure of the black worker with a pile of corn stalks and the body of an animal, creating a bushy, four-legged creature that seems to slowly plod forward. In Nancy Applebaum's thorough study on the Choreographic Commission, she describes the tensions between unity and diversity. Even as the leaders of the country and the commission believed that a prosperous republic required a well-behaved population in a well-defined territory, and associated progress with whiteness and homogeneity. They documented the racial diversity and the regional fragmentation of the country. We see the same tensions of unity and diversity in the work of 19th century landscape painters, like Church, who struggled to compose endless parts into a cohesive whole, or Heed, who rejected conventional approaches to pictorial unity with his big orchids and sharply rendered hummingbirds, superimposed over tiny forests and hazy skies. This is also a tension that I think we feel now, particularly in museum work, as we strive for inclusion in both the works of art that we present and the audiences whom we serve. And so as we consider this tension or this challenge of reconciling diversity with unity, instead of approaching it the same way that our predecessors did in the 19th century and simply repeating old methods of homogenization in our own field, sort of you know, using our own conventions as art historians, such as clean narratives of influence and tight chronologies. While many recent studies of 19th century art, particularly landscape, have rejected the equation of nation building with progress, maybe now we bring that same critical lens to definitions of modernity or science, which is still often described as completely neutral, even though there is no way to so highly prize notions of discovery or technology without erasing indigenous peoples and histories in the process. Maybe it doesn't matter that when he wrote about the beautiful plumage of hummingbirds and the surprising amount of nectar that they consume, he did not know that the Kogi people, native to the Santa Marta Mountains that he drew, had already long expressed these traits of hummingbirds as a concept of duality in their religion and embodied these ideas in songs and dances that are still performed today. So this means that different experts working art in different forms reach the same conclusion. For all that we know about landscape paintings and the white men who made them, maybe we still have much to learn about the many different forms of art that engage with the histories and representations of the lands in the Americas. Thank you so much, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Laila. Y me gustaría abrir eh, el espacio para, si, para ver si hay alguna pregunta o algún comentario sobre esta ponencia. Realmente hay, hay mucho sobre lo que reflexionar. Has tocado muchos temas, muchos países, muchos géneros. Se me ocurre que un tema recurrente eh, de, tu, de tu charla, Laila, es el tema de la domesticación. Eh, porque aparece tanto en, 
la domesticación del paisaje en los cuadros de Heath, que has comentado el, el formato pequeño, ¿no? que es una manera de, de domesticar la naturaleza, pero también la domesticación de diferentes eh, gentes, de diferentes clases y, clases y razas en los cuadros que has mostrado eh, del costumbrismo. Eh, no sé si es algo de lo que querrías hablar, pero... Ven, ven, ven. I'm at the beginning of this research, and um, you know, one of this was also an idea that I am very interested in in domestication of the landscape, specifically because the emphasis on traveler artists is always sort of the heroic, um, like methods of travel, um, and it's actually like in Maggie's work on Heed, I think, where this really is highlighted that Heed was not interested in some kind of like rough and tumble like version of traveling. Um, and the reason that we have artists who are going to Latin America um, in this moment is because a group of industrialists went before them, right, and like made railroads and like set up like steamship lines. And so I, I always think that that is really, really important that like before we have art, we have the introduction of industry. And so there's a connection um, between the work that is being made, which is created specifically often to erase the presence of industry in these places. Um, and the fact that it, it is so, they are so reliant on these industries in order to be made. They're actually like quite reliant on the domestication of the landscape. The other place where we see this is in patronage, which is another, with studies on landscape from the US especially, is always interesting to me because it is very well known that the majority of the people who buy landscape paintings in the 19th century are directly responsible for the destruction of the landscape. So it tends to almost always be people who ha are building railroads or who are mining minerals, especially in Latin America, but also in the US and also today, quite frankly. Um, and so I think that like the, we're still very seduced by narratives of like a wilderness as if that's like a real thing rather than like a constructed thing and rather than something that is also directly related to the destroying of these very places that are then sort of shown, you know, wondrously. And what I love about Heat is that he actually, I think, is much closer, that those realities, I think, are shaping his work and in a way that is sort of um, honest versus the kind of like high illusion of like church or, or Bierstadt. So yeah, look forward to talking more. Yes, Maggie. Thanks, that was such a great talk. Um, I, I, I loved seeing all the, um, you know, the artworks that were made during the time in Brazil and Colombia and stuff that, you know, just doesn't get much attention, I think. And I'm really struck by the ways in which it is so continuous with the kind of colonial traditions that came before it, mm -hmm. you know, like you talked about, like the, the you know, the dying native mm -hmm. and this like botanical practice that is clearly kind of related to the Royal Botanical um, Studies. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do we, I mean, how do we deal with that? I, I, particularly like if you're anticipating this to become more of like some kind of exhibition, um, you know, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, this seems like a great opportunity to think about, okay, what is going on? Because we've been telling these narratives in American landscape painting of like right. these white men who go to Latin America and like exploit people there and consume, you know, the things that they sell. And that is a problematic story. But then at the same time to show what is going on in that country is also a kind of right. colonial. Yeah, well, because um, it's white leadership, right, in both yeah. places. So, like, that's also, I think, something, like, a few things. Like, I think people in the U.S. have a hard time understanding, like, racial differences, like, within their own country, but then also in other countries, too. So it's, like, the thought is always from the U.S. that, like, everybody is, like, brown, right, in, like, Colombia or Mexico. And, like, that's almost never true. Like, it's still, like, a white leadership, right? And so it actually makes a lot of sense that we're seeing the same things. Um, so I don't know, like, I don't know, like, the solution that you're, <laughs> you're hinting at, but I can tell you what I think we should not do, which is I think we should not um, make the countries in Latin America look as if it is just a belated 
thing, right? That it's like, okay, so we have like nationalist landscapes in the US and then they happen in Colombia. Or like we have like a, a, a system of um, nationalistic portraiture with images of George Washington or whatever in like 1808 and then that happens in Brazil but it's in 1860. Like it's, a, I think the, the more interesting story is that these types of images have currency. They work for everybody depending on the moment in which they are, whether it is independence or whether it is nation building. So like the like sexy dying indigenous woman, I don't think it's a matter that like Mireles looked in whatever in 1866, looked at Crawford in 1840. I think it's that that is an image that is useful, right, for whoever is in that moment of like nation building where they like need to sort of create a certain type of fiction in order to build a like white dominated country. And like that's the part that I think is really exciting that it's like we're seeing the same visual language pop up in kind of different, in different countries, but like the moment that they're in, the sort of headspace that they're in is actually the same. It just sort of happens at different times. Um, does that make sense? That yeah, absolutely. Question? Well, I, I, I mean, I will also bring it up because, you know, we, I mean, the, 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 the idea of a settler colonialism is so prominent in the way we think about the uh, history of American art right. in the U.S., but, you know, it's not, it, it, the term isn't, I think, as active, or maybe it right. is in these other countries. I don't know if we use countries. that in Latin America or not, actually. Right, so, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, um, to, to think about it in yeah. that way. So, you know, there's, like, a, a multiple, I mean, I, the, the reason I love what you're doing is because of the sort of multiple layers that it's complicated, that it's not just, oh, let's look at what's going on in Latin America as a contrast of, you yeah, know. Yeah, no, right? yeah. I think I'm really struck by how it's essentially like the same thing, right? And um, I think actually I was speaking with Fernando the other day and it's like, I think what, what I'm worried about losing sight of is then the specificities because I get so excited by the fact that it's the same thing, right? That we can sort of see the same, that like landscape is functioning the same way, that indigenous bodies are functioning the same way, that um, there is still, it's like a funny, like, you know, undergraduate, like research paper where it has to be like, these things are similar but different. And it's like, where, like the, the specificity I think still has to sort of be contained. And that's actually why Brazil, is an exciting place to start because um, one thing that I learned is that even in Brazilian scholarship, it is fairly always glossed over the fact that this is an empire. There's like a king of Brazil at a moment when you have some of the most radical revolutionaries in Colombia especially. And it's like these places are right next to each other. And like that is wild, right? That Brazil has such a different history in that way very much tied to histories of slavery, but also very much tied to a tiny white minority in what is essentially a black country. And that is the other sort of, I think, important line of research that has completely fallen out of like heat scholarship and church scholarship and like just people from the US going to Latin America is how black these places are. Like Santa Marta is like the blackest place in Colombia, right, still. And so that's why um, I think it is, it's painful to look at that uh, heed sketch um, of the black figure, but then it's also, there's something important there about the visibility of a black figure when particularly today, we don't have enough discussion about like blackness, I would say specifically in countries like Colombia. Like, yeah, so. I have one more okay. <laughs> short follow-up. Well, I'm just curious um, to what extent I don't, I don't actually know, even though I've written a lot about Heath, I don't actually know, you know, in terms of his, um, like, did, he, was, you know, he definitely differentiated racial and class things, you know, when he traveled, but uh, I'm just wondering to, to what extent he would have made that kind of, uh, or he or, and other artists too, the recognition of like the kind of colonial order that persists in, in, and the indigenous um, sort of the, the right. relationship between those. I mean, I know like church, for instance, like when he was in um, Ecuador, he definitely uh, interacted with Quechua speaking people who were oh, guides okay. and stuff for him. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I just don't know. Like, I don't, did I they perceive yeah. 
this sort of just a blanket kind of otherness. Right. You know, I think or, indigenous people oh, yeah. were really invisible to Heed. That is like, that would be my sense, that it's sort of like, I don't think he can tell the difference the same way that I think people in the U.S. have trouble telling the difference now. Um, I don't think he could tell the difference really between like white working class Brazilians and indigenous Brazilian, like, you know, sort of, or like Missies or like Brazilians. Um, I think there is something, and I don't know about this as well either, but like um, there are black figures also in Heed's images of New England. Um, and so I think there's like a sort of a bigger question there just about like his perceptions sort of both in, in Latin America, but also like um, outside of Latin America. So I think like there has been at least like one argument that it is sort of like, abolitionist or whatever, which is like pretty hard to believe once you like see him writing about going to Brazil. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you.